And hello, welcome to the ASP.NET Community Standup. I'm John Galloway, I'm a PM on the .NET community team. And I'm really excited today to welcome on my friend all the way from Istanbul, Halil, speaking about ADP Framework, so. Hello, John. Welcome. So I last saw you in Istanbul, I, I, it feels like forever ago, but, and uh, today, just, just a, a special memory of my time over there. I drank way too much Turkish coffee. <laughs> Uh, so I, I made a special one today. So, so this is really exciting. Um, and so, and ABP, like I, I've followed over the years, and it's really grown. You've you've just had some recent releases. Um, so, awesome. Well, I will start as I always do with the community links, and we'll go through those, and then we'll turn it over to you and learn more about ABP. So these are the community links I'm featuring for today. And we'll get right to them. This is one that came to me over Twitter. Uh, so this is Damselfly. And this is interesting. It's a Blazor.NET 6 web app for uh, photo management. So the big uh, thing recently, they added in multi-user support. So this you can have multiple different users, with some with like read-only, um, different you know, different types of user accounts. Uh, so it's very performant, it handles all kinds of different uh, image types, et cetera. So really neat, this is a very cool project. I'll keep an eye on it. Uh, Oleg has been tweeting about .NET recently. I've been following for a while, I love his tweets. They're just, um, they're very, uh, so he'll do these short little graphics and he'll just explain, here's, you know, here's a new feature and here's how the code looks before and after. So I, um, I just love, you know, like occasionally things will just pop up in my, in my Twitter feed and I'll just learn or uh, understand something a little bit better. So uh, very much encourage following him. All right, HTTP3 support in .NET 6. So HTTP keeps marching on. We had 1.1 forever. Then we got HTTP2, which allows like batching and, and um, framing and so sending multiple different things in one connection which is nice but then there's a problem they call it the head of line problem where basically if you miss one thing then it's got to redo the whole kind of block um, so http3 uses quick which is uh, built with udp and tls so a lot of neat magical things going on under the hood protocol wise uh, the the real takeaway is that there's now support for it and so this is uh, in .NET 6, and so uh, this post goes through the support both in Kestrel on the server, and then also in the HTTP3 client. And then, of course, HTTP3 relies on the OS and, and um, you know, the web server supporting as well, and so then there's multiple additional things to, to look through there. All right. This is one that's kind of near and dear to my heart. I've been uh, using Azure Functions um, with .NET 5 and, and .NET 6, and it's pretty cool that you can do that now. Well, I've used .NET 5 because .NET 6 support just came out. Um, but what's neat with Azure Functions is they have this new isolated model where you can host, uh, it's, it's separate between the host and the process you're running. Uh, before, it was all kind of one big process. And so that, that's really cool to be able to support new versions. Um, it's always been frustrating for me over time, waiting for, you know, there'll be a new .NET release and I'd be waiting for functions to support it. And now because of this isolated model, they can do that. So awesome, Anthony and team. Uh, speaking of Anthony, here's another Anthony. Uh, so Anthony Duretti uh, talking about streaming JSON responses with Angular. So I've shared some things on this recently about streaming JSON, um, using JSON-LD, uh, using, um, using streaming support. And so, uh, so now with this here, here's an example showing doing this with Angular. So implementing it in an application. Um, and I like this, it's got a, a short little um, video showing this as it's going across. So just streaming information via JSON uh, built into .NET 6. I love, by the way, seeing all these, all our friends from around the world popping in. Um, got uh, 
Malaysia and Turkey and, and all over. And um, so thank you very much. This is wonderful. Um, OK, almost done with my community links. Uh, so Andrew Locke has been going through under the hood a lot of um, a lot of more advanced stuff that's built into .NET 6. So there's the web application builder, which makes it very easy to do these kind of lightweight models. Um, and so what Anthony's been doing is kind of digging into how does it work, how does the code behind it work, et cetera. So uh, here, here he explores the web application builder. He's got some great diagrams in here uh, showing, you know, here's the public API for it, and then uh, the things he really digs into here are the configure web or web host builder and configure host builder, and these kind of serve as escape hatches that allow you for uh, if you need to use something that was in a previous version uh, that was done using the previous builder, uh, you can get in and do that. So you can still use web application builder, and then you can go down and configure things at a more deep level. So explaining how that works and uh, showing some example code. He also just digs into the source code and talks through you know, how, the, how bootstrapping works and how all the different parts of it are set up. So I encourage reading this and I'm sure I will read this post again in the future when I'm re re uh, using web host builder and I need to use some, some code that uh, I need to get the backward compatibility for. And then the last link I'm sharing is just ABPIO, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Halil, because um, I figured you'd go into this in more depth. But um, you've got a great website there that explains what you're doing and also has some great docs and tutorials. I feel like that's a common problem with, um, you know, with both uh, open source and, you know, like a, a lot of projects have pretty lacking documentation. It's not always up to date. The tutorials aren't great. And I think your project is a really good example of one that does make it easy to get started. Thank you, because documentation is very hard, uh, maybe harder than coding. So most it really of people is. just yeah. creating great pro projects, but cannot have time to uh, document it. Yeah, yep. Well, so so uh, should I share your screen now? If you want yeah. All right. OK, uh, shall I start? Go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, today, I will uh, talk about uh, ABP framework. I will uh, make some introduction. Then I will show some live coding and presentation mixed uh, talk. Uh, let's start with the first question. Uh, first of all, ABP is an open source web application framework for ASP.NET Core. So you may ask, why do we need an application framework? Isn't ASP.NET Core sufficient for our requirements? OK, uh, when you create a new project with plain ASP.NET Core, uh, if you are creating a serious project, you will uh, build uh, a lot of infrastructure uh, based on that uh, MP2 solution. First of all, you should decide the architecture. You should prepare a solution structure. Maybe you want to. Uh, apply uh, layered architecture with the domain driven design or another uh, development style. So you should care about that. Then you should explore and adapt uh, some libraries and essential tools you uh, want to use on this uh, project. Then you uh, need also need to set, uh, set up a test infrastructure to create automated tests. And you will care about how to deploy your application to uh, Kubernetes or Azure or uh, another environment. Uh, this is just the beginning, actually. Uh, you typically uh, want to not repeat yourself as a developer we hate. Uh, so don't repeat yourself. We should uh, generally need to create some uh, infrastructure uh, for, uh, not, uh, for automating some cross-cutting concerns like authorization, validation, some exception handling. So uh, the purpose here to re reduce the repeating code. Uh, and also we uh, typically in a uh, serious software project need to uh, integrate to external systems like RabbitMQ, Redis, or another uh, tool or third party providers. We should uh, generally create some abstractions to simplify our application code. 
And also we generally create some base classes for common service types uh, and helpers to implement uh, that architecture correctly by all the developers. So the problem of this approach is uh, making it reusable is very hard because when we create a, a good architecture in a project, then we start a new project. So we start from scratch. We, we may just copy everything, but it doesn't, it just uh, don't work uh, in practical actually, because uh, we cannot document that solution structure and a lot of uh, code is uh, actually highly coupled uh, to our specific project. So it's not being reusable. <clears throat> and also every developer has uh, her own coding style. So uh, determining a coding standard and convention is not easy among developers. And also document documenting that architecture and infrastructure is not easy. So. Uh, some big companies like banks creating their own infrastructure and uh, internal framework for that purpose, but most of companies have no uh, such a chance and uh, they need to start from scratch or uh, should use some pre-built uh, infrastructure. Actually, this was uh, again just beginning because you will have some common non-business requirements. For example, if you want to create a multi-tenancy system, it's really a dedicated work to create a multi-tenancy infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Like uh, if you typically want to create background job quiz, feature toggling infrastructure, permission-based authorization system, a lot of more. And uh, when you come to user interface, you will create a UI layout as a responsible and modern layout with team, with a team. You should work on login register, user permission management pace, and much more. So ABP framework actually tries to fill the gap between the plain ASP.NET Core and enterprise software requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, it offers a modern and maintainable software architecture and provides the necessary infrastructure, tooling, documentation, examples, articles to implement that infrastructure and architecture correctly. Uh, it is a great community I will mention later again. Uh, we are actually continuously discussing with uh, the community to decide uh, what to do next in that architecture. The architecture is evolving continuously and it works on latest .NET Core. We have just upgraded to uh, .NET 6 uh, in recent uh, days. So uh, just after the ASP, uh, ASP.NET Core uh, release, we will uh, release a stable version of ABP framework with .NET 6. Uh, we are uh, trying to use the tools you already know, like Ant Framework, uh, Bootstrap, Automapper, uh, RabbitMQ, Identity Server, and some already known and mature products, rather than creating everything uh, ourselves. That's a good idea because it's it makes the learning curve uh, easier uh, and uh, easy adaptation. ABP's architecture stands on four common concepts. First of all, it's based on domain-driven design uh, principles and it is a layered solution architecture based on DDD. Second, it's modular. Uh, this is one of the topics uh, we uh, decided to rewrite the enti entire framework, framework to make it more modular. Currently, when you create a new solution, you have a lot of functionality, but all of them are coming from individual modules. Uh, I will show uh, in the demo. So um, the most important features, uh, one of the most important features of ABP is multi-tenancy. It has everything to create a multi-tenant uh, multi application. Uh, multi-tenancy is used generally to create software as a service applications and also it's microservice ready you know it's popular it's uh, it's already adopted actually uh, so ABP provides the necessary infrastructure and tooling for uh, creating microservice solutions we are already creating example solutions I will mention that later uh, it's currently it's actually a UI and database independent uh, but uh, it comes with pre, uh, it comes with three uh, UI options out of the box. Uh, MVC, actually Razorface uh, as a server side uh, rendered HTML, and Angular and Blazor. Blazor uh, WebAssembly and Server it supports both, and also it works with Ant Framework Core, 
Uh, it can be combined with Dapper when you want to uh, make low level uh, queries. And it also works with MongoDB for NoSQL databases. Uh, ABP framework was uh, first uh, released as ASP.NET boilerplate. It has uh, been uh, eight years ago uh, and it uh, evolved to ABP IO by the time. So in this talk, I'm talking about the ABP framework. Uh, this was a quick introduction. Uh, now I want to uh, introduce some highlights to make you understand what ABP actually do, do for us. Uh, I will show a concept, then I will uh, make a demo for it. Okay. Uh, I, the, yeah. In case, so first of all, I have to say we've got people watching from all over the world, which is really exciting. Um, some things that you called out there that are just really powerful, like first of all, multi-tenancy is really hard to do right in ASP.NET. So you, you can think you did multi-tenancy right, and then accidentally you're leaking information between different tenants, or you know what I mean? You're not you're not a fully secure. Yeah, that's tenant. one of the most important concepts. We have hard to work on that. Uh, yeah, it completely isolates tenants, uh, tenant data, but not only database. It isolates cache, it's all, it isolates uh, event pass, and whatever you think, the whole framework is uh, developed uh, the multi-tenancy in mind. That's very important. And uh, it makes your application multi-tenant unaware. This is one of the big benefits. You just write regular code, you just make little touch to your entities, like uh, implementing an iMultiTenant interface then your entity is becoming multi-tenant. So uh, actually it's, uh, it's multi-tenancy is very strong. Uh, one other thing that you talked about is that you have a, um, a good architecture. It's a, it's a um, sophisticated architecture, but it's easy to get started with and it's documented well. And I've worked in enterprises before. I've worked in financial companies where we had meetings twice a month or something to argue about the architecture. And everybody would argue, I think that the domain object should go here. Well, I think that the services should go here. And it's a waste of time, really. For a lot of businesses, it's great to just say, here's, here's a, a tested architecture. It's used by a lot of uh, businesses. It's, it's, you know, it's, um, it's been tested and advanced over time. And we don't need to do that in our business. We can just, you know, build on top of that. So I, I, I just uh, wish I had those hours back that I wasted sitting in meetings arguing about architecture when, you know, it's, it's not something that every business needs to solve. That's that's a great point. Yeah. <laughs> All right, go ahead. I just I, I think there's some really really okay, cool thank things. You much. Uh, let's uh, start uh, from client to server communication. Uh, think about a typical web request. Uh, we have a Blazor WebAssembly application. We want to consume some REST API on the server side. Actually, we have we do a lot of similar thing in every method call. For example, we deal with uh, REST endpoints. Uh, we deal with GET or POST request. We deal with JSON serialization, exception handling. How to handle the exception? Uh, should we show a message to user or uh, what about error codes and a lot of problems, actually. Uh, ABP completely automates that. I will uh, show in the demo. And also in the server side, uh, there are some pre-built middlewares and filters, which makes uh, completely automated or uh, simplifies validation, authorization, exception handling, uh, some audit logging features, and uh, the database connection and transaction management. I will just make a, a quick demo to uh, demonstrate how we can consume uh, APIs from Blazor application. Okay, we have some some questions, and I assume you're probably covering this later. But some people are asking, you know, is it free, and what's the difference between the free and commercial versions and that sort of thing? Um, uh, actually, uh, the open source uh, the framework is completely free, open source, and uh, it will be like that always. Uh, the ABP commercial is providing some pre built modules, uh, some teams, UI teams, some code generation tooling, 
and support based on the framework. It's not an alternative. It's not something like a free version or commercial version. No, it's not like that. Actually, the commercial package or commercial subscription directly use the framework. So framework is very strong and all the hard and low level stuff is done in the framework side. The commercial side uh, provides prebute modules so you don't uh, waste your time to create some uh, common business modules like file management system, like identity server management UI or some uh, team uh, system like that. But the framework uh, actually provides a very good value. Uh, I, I, came, uh, I come to this topic later if we have time. Okay, uh, that sounds good. Okay, let's, let's start the demo. Uh, first of all, uh, ABP has a CLI, uh, so we can easily create new projects. You see there is an empty folder here, and I'm just typing ABP new. Demo app. I want to use Blazor. If I want, I can specify server, but I don't want to uh, now. Blazor is WebAssembly by default, and I want the application. Did you Blazor? Oh, sorry. sorry. I thought you misspelled Blazor. I, I couldn't see. That yeah. looks good. It opens the documentation. Uh, now the solution is created. Uh, you see all the layers are, have uh, pre uh, set up uh, test projects, including anti framework core mocked by uh, SQL Lite uh, in memory database, and all the tests uh, is arranged. And this is the layers and utilities of the solution. I have already opened the solution, so I can just uh, open the solution. Now I want to uh, create a server-side API and consume from the Blazor application. We have two projects here. Application.contracts project is important. This uh, project is shared by server and client applications. This is very uh, powerful feature of Blazor. So we can share uh, contracts between client and server. So, so IBP takes this uh, and makes it uh, better by uh, directly using interfaces I will show. Let's create a values app service. I will just copy paste some code so don't waste your time. Assume that we have a values uh, application service. We are getting a value and increase it. It's very basic. Just I want to show uh, the communication part. Uh, the can, contracts. Can you zoom? I'm sorry, but can you zoom in the um, text a little bit more? Is it good now? A uh, little bit more, even. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, now we have defined our application service interface. Now we can implement it. I am driving my application services from the application service base class of the ABP framework. This uh, brings me some conventional features. Uh, and I am uh, implementing the I value app service. Just uh, I will copy the code. It's very simple code, but I will copy. Because I have a value and I'm getting it and increase it uh, with another method. This is uh, just a plain class. This is not an API controller. It's not uh, an MVC controller. Now I am running the host site. Actually, the server side is done. When I run the server site, I see a pre-integrated Swagger UI. And also, I see a values API with get, post, and automatically created uh, API controller from the application service by naming and uh, other conventions. Uh, I, want, I will not go to details, but you typically write application services, play classes, and it creates the REST API for us. Then we can go to servers, uh, to go to client side, the Blazor application. First of all, I want to run without uh, making anything. 
I just wanted uh, to show it. Okay, the laser application uh, seems empty at the beginning with a welcome page, but uh, is translated to different language. When I click to login, it's uh, redirecting to the server side for OpenID uh, Connect authorization, authentication, which is pretty standard. It's using identity server for authenticating here. It's all integrated at the beginning. So now I, hand, I can see uh, the uh, pre-built module pace because I have logged, logged in as admin. I can see role management page, user management page. I can click a user and set its permissions. Uh, I can create new tenants. I will show about this and some email settings. This is my minimalist startup template. Uh, not all modules are installed. Uh, just for identity, tenant management, and setting folders are uh, installed here. I want to log out and return the uh, WebAssembly application. Now I will uh, delete this page and create some simple functionality that consumes the server side. Uh, I'm just deleting. Uh, let's start from the... Uh, C sharp code. Uh, here I am in the browser actually, but I can just inject the same application service. Uh, first of all, Blazor uh, doesn't allow uh, constructor injection by default. ABP uh, replaces its uh, dependency injection provider, so uh, we can use the uh, constructor injection uh, here. I want to just define a, a private variable here uh, and I will overwrite on initialize it and wait subservice. Okay, what I want is just uh, like injecting a typical service, just like it is in the same application, and calling its methods. That's all. ABP handles all the uh, functionality. It uh, understands this is a GET request. It's, uh, if I pass some parameters, it's uh, converting to JSON, make a HTTP request, get its response, it adds authorization headers if available it adds localization multi-tenancy headers do a lot of things but this is just a, uh, is not uh, shown to us it's just a regular method call uh, then i want to add another uh, method here increase the value it's same i am just calling the increase method and getting the value again uh, and the uh, Code side is actually done. I can just open the Razor side. And you know Blazor, I'm showing the current value and I have a button here. This button component is Blazorize. You have already uh, made a oh, yeah. uh, show with Blazorize. ABP uh, Blazor UI is completely based on the Blazorize library. It's a very good library and provides abstraction over uh, the Bootstrap, you know, so we we can uh, write uh, Bootstrap code in a type safe manner, uh, color pri primary, and on click I'm calling the increase method. That's all. Now I rerun the application. So and while you're doing that, um, it's important to for people joining in later or whatever. So you're showing a Blazor example, but it also supports MVC, Razor Pages, and then also- Definitely. I, I just want to show Blazor uh, since yeah, it's yeah. popular <laughs> and you yeah. like Blazor. <laughs> of course, yeah. I just want to make sure everyone knew also it works with yeah. Razor Pages. Let MVC. me show network request. You see that we are in Blazor WebAssembly application and uh, clicking a button.
Uh, okay, you see, we are getting a web request. I didn't understand why this all showing. Okay, uh, in the Blazor application, we can just increase the value. It's making a real HTTP request from uh, client side. What we have done is actually really simple. Let me show from the uh, GitHub desktop. Oh, okay, it's not easy to see. Let me show. We have done in the server side, we have created a simple service. We can just share the same application contract, application service interface with the client. And we have reused the application service in the client side, uh, just regular uh, method call, and all works. All the uh, complexity is handled by the ABP framework. It's that simple. No code generation. Uh, uh, you know, uh, th this kind of tools are generally creating some client-side code with a tool, uh, some proxy generation. This is called uh, client-side proxies. Let's improve this example to add more feature. Let's see how exception handling works. For example, I want uh, to add an I'm in the server side. No, not yet. And I'm just checking if value uh, is greater than 50. Throw new. Now I'm just throwing an exception on the server side. I'm not just, uh, you typically write a try catch here, a handle exception and uh, send a proper response to the client. But uh, ABP automatically handles all the exceptions. So you typically don't do anything. User friend exception is a special kind of exception. It directly shows this message to the user. So in the client side also, you don't have to do anything. Uh, it works in every uh, UI, Blazor, MVC or Angular. Uh, the server side is actually okay. Uh, just I want to restart the server to take the effect. Okay, I don't need to refresh the UI. Okay, when I reach to 50. Okay, I cannot uh, increase it more. I'm getting the error. Okay, that's good. Uh, we haven't done any exception handling code. We It automatically shows error message to user. Everything works as expected. If we, for example, if we throw a SQL exception, it doesn't show the SQL statement to the user. It just hides details and shows a nice uh, message. So don't worry. Uh, there are kind of exceptions, and it also returns a proper HTTP response to the client. Actually, all the things you typically manually do is automatically handled. You don't see so much thing, but this is the value <laughs> because there is no code we write. Everything works automatically. So I also want to show an authorization. For example, I want to restrict the usage of this uh, method from non-authenticated uh, users. Uh, to do that, we can just use uh, authorize attribute. See that this is a plain class. This is an application service, not controller, but authorize attribute still works. This is standard attribute of ASP.NET Core. Okay, this prevents non uh, sign in users cannot uh, execute this method, but I want to define a permission uh, because ABP has a low level and fine-tuned, actually, permission system. There is a uh, permission definition provider. I want to show the permission system. We can define permissions, for example, can increase uh, value. This is our unique name for this permission. Uh, when we define a permission, we can uh, set a display name uh, for that. Uh, this display name can be localized. Uh, ABP use JSON files, simple JSON files for localization. 
So just I am typing can increase the value. This is name of the permission. Okay. Okay. Now I am restarting the uh, server side. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm just copying the permission name here. So this permission is actually a policy. You already know policies in ASP.NET Core. This is automatic policies. All permissions are uh, can be used as policies. Nice. Okay, so I've used policies before, but I had to write code for them. So what you're showing there is configuring those policies in a JSON file, and it's it's definitely actually JSON file for uh, was for localization. What I have done is just oh. one line definition. I Got created it, okay. a new permission with a name, and uh, this is optional actually. This is sufficient, but I have created a localized name and localized it uh, in the JSON file. Uh, and okay. Uh, okay, I now edit uh, an authorized attribute with a policy name uh, or permission name. Now I uh, open the Blazor application. Try to increase. But it says not unauthorized. We, we will. We should improve this message. I see that. <laughs> but actually, uh, normally you should not uh, put this button here if the user has no permission. Okay, let's do that. Oh, oh let's uh, show another thing before that. Uh, we got an unauthorized exception. This is actually uh, a for all. Uh, Okay. Anyway, okay. We we got an unauthorized response. I will log in with admin. Now I have all the permissions, but I still don't have this permission. The messages uh, change it because I have logged in. Actually, I have authenticated, but I I have not authorized yet. Okay, to authorize myself. I can use the role management page. Uh, I can uh, set permissions on the role page. And I see demo up here, can increase the value, the text we have entered the JSON file. It automatically comes to permission management UI. When I save the dialog, I can return the page. Uh, I need to refresh because it's caching permissions, the Blazor suck. Now I in can increase the value, I have the permission. Uh, so this permission system is very powerful and customizable. It uh, works with role basis by default, but I also can override per user. For example, uh, we have a John user as Volosoft. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we can set uh, John's permission per user. Uh, if a, a permission is not inherited from a role, we can specify for the user. And uh, we had we had one question come in earlier. It's it's kind of specific, but asking about the hosting. So, is it possible to host like your front end with Blazor in something like Cloudflare? Um, yeah, it definitely can. Uh, we are actually actively using uh, Cloudflare in our uh, company, so no problem. It can it can be hosted anywhere in Azure or uh, Kubernetes, uh, so it works everywhere. It's, it's standard .NET Core application, actually, yeah. not so different. So we have added authorize, authorization uh, here. It's very simple. We can add it in class level. This is a standard, so I don't want to mention. But the powerful uh, stuff is we are just defining permissions, and it appears on the UI. We can just assign to rows everything works as expected. And also, I want to show some fancy UI features, like normally you do a lot of code for to uh, make this happen. For example, let's make a confirmation because uh, increase. ABP has a lot of uh, useful utility services for that, uh, like that. 
One of them is message api.confirm. Are you sure to increase? Okay, I just copy inside the if block. And I also want to show a notification after the increase. Uh, notify that success. Increased. Okay, wait. Okay, that's all. Just rerunning the Blazor application. This kind of utility, utility service is very important because in every project we repeat all uh, of them again and again. There are a lot of such services. So it shows a, a confirmation. I can cancel or accept. Yeah, a notification appears here. It's integrated to known libraries like uh, Toaster uh, and Civit Alert. A Blazor Rise site is not using Civit Alert, but for MVC site, it's using like that. So uh, let's, uh, I'm checking if anything. Yeah, the one last thing is that uh, on this demo, uh, we have aut automatically working audit logging system. Let me show the database. Uh, we have an ABP audit log uh, system. The, when you install this module, which is uh, pre-installed when you create a new solution, uh, it has some tables to log every action uh, in the uh, application. For example, for audit log table, we see all the actions here. We call it increase method. We uh, log the new to the uh, application. We see all the HTTP status codes uh, and browser information. If user has logged in, we can see which user was that, uh, how much milliseconds it gets to execute this method. All these kinds of uh, stuff are automatically logged, but it's not limited to that. We see all the application service method called with all the parameters. Uh, we can see all the entities changed in this request. Uh, we can see all the properties of these entities to track which user changed it, which entity's property, uh, and so on. This is especially useful, and almost all uh, enterprise enterprise companies are uh, needing that functionality. Mm -hmm. So it just works out of the box. If we just don't want that, we can just disable audit logging, but it is enabled by default. It just works like that. Uh, we, we've yeah. had a few questions come in about identity server and of course identity server is a little complicated because there's a paid version and that sort of thing so it's you're integrated with identity server but it's not fully required right you work with the microsoft identity uh actually it depends uh, for mvc ui it's optional uh, because mvc ui can uh, authenticate the user itself but for uh, blazer uh, we have no alternative yet because Blazor, uh, you know, for best practice for single page applications is OpenID protocol with OAuth 2. Mm. And uh, this is provided by Island Server for now. It's not, uh, yeah, there, there are some libraries, but uh, it cannot be accomplished with plain Microsoft Ident library. It has not such a functionality to make your application a uh, authentication server, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you you may use Azure or some uh, online providers, but if you want to add the server side functionality in your applications, uh, actually uh, this is not possible with plain identity library. No, but okay. we are expecting from Microsoft to make a solution for that. <laughs> so uh, okay, um, okay. A few questions came in about like personal information. Um, so this is one, um, this is about logging. How do you control like log retention and that sort of thing? And then he also had an earlier question about um, GDPR. And yeah, it, it works like that. Uh, for example, everything is logged by default, but you can uh, just enable, disable, or uh, give some filters. For example, uh, if we have a DTO here, like personal 
info DTO is serialized into JSON and logged log in in the database by default. For example, it has a uh, string password and it has name here. Okay, you want to uh, lock the name, but you don't want to lock the password. Is uh, the disable auditing is also works here uh, per property base. So if you uh, add this here or here, it's not logged. Oh, okay. There is a uh, functionality. I don't remember if it is completed. It also can encrypt uh, some values uh, with declarative. Uh, way. But I, I don't remember now if it was completed. Okay, great. Okay. Any more question? Well, there are a few. I, I don't want to interrupt you too much. Um, there's so Jimmy's asking, what do you see as ABP's sweet spot? Are you targeting database, CRUD apps, something broader? Um, and then, you know, great response here. NASA is using it. So, you know, I mean, but what are some of the like key best fits and what are some areas that it's not the best fit? Yeah, actually, uh, we are targeting enterprise uh, softwares, uh, not uh, simple, maybe one, uh, one month or two month length uh, small projects. Yeah, it, it's, they can also get benefit, but our feature set is uh, actually for um, enterprise softwares, uh, which uh, you, you want to create maintainable software a long-term software. But for simple CRUD applications, actually, it's easier uh, with ABP framework because let me show, for example, public uh, class not controller, uh, not controller, op service, can inherit from CRUD op service with some generic entity and DTO properties, then all the uh, CRUD functionality uh, in the server side completed that it uh, brings all the functionality here so mm -hmm. it has it's very uh, detailed and you uh, customizable so for simple crude applications you write less code actually uh, i think avp is proper for every kind of application for everyone i suggest just to check it uh, to understand if it uh, it fits uh, their uh, application I don't know if you'll have time to show it, but I, I played with the the new CMS features, um, and that makes it that extends what you could do with it quite a bit. It seems like because it includes um, you know, like in the web page, I can create blogs and pages and all kinds of you know. It's, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's an ongoing project uh, CMS kit. I will come to that later at the end of okay. the presentation. Uh, so, so one other can question. Continue. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, one more question. But uh, so a few more questions on like um, on GDPR. So specific. You talked about auditing, but so say for instance, can I as a user go through and delete my data and all, all that sort of thing? Oh, we, actually, uh, ABP framework doesn't uh, hold uh, much data about the user. Just audit logging and user table, uh, and they are pretty standard. Uh, so they should care about uh, this uh, topic themselves because they will uh, know their data and ABP doesn't provide a previous solution for that. Okay. Okay, let's continue with yeah. simple ap application service and see what uh, how ABP framework uh, helps us with a simple uh, use case. You see a typical application service that creates a book uh, in the database. First of all, this is inherited from application service. So ABP knows that this class is an application service and behaves based on that. For example, it automatically registers this service to dependency injection as a transient service. So, so you don't deal with dependency injection. You can just use iRepository interface for your uh, aggregate routes and entities. So uh, you, uh, for most of the standard uh, operations, you can just use the generic repositories. It uh, has authorization uh, and permission system. I have just uh, made a demo about that, uh, used with attributes. It has a unit of work system. That's very great because 
uh, you write uh, no code for uh, database connection and transaction management. You just write your code. If you just throw an exception, ABP rollbacks all the operations in that request. If you don't throw an exception, it's just committed in the database. It just works by convention uh, and can be controlled and fine-tuned by attributes, but most of the time you don't have to worry about that. It automatically validates all the inputs. It also checks if it is null uh, and it's a valid throughout uh, standard data annotations. And also it's integrated with full end validator. Uh, most of people like that library. Uh, so it almost automates the validation. If it's not valid, uh, your method is not called at all. Uh, you don't have to check if the model is valid and so on. Hmm. Uh, it's automatically audit log it. Log it. I have already uh, shown that. Uh, the exception management system automatically handles all exceptions, communicates to the client and handles gracefully in the client side. There are uh, different kinds of exceptions and exceptions calls. Uh, but it's a uh, complicated stuff now. No. Uh, I have already shown the localization system. Uh, it has object to object mapping uh, abstraction and works with automapper library by default. And there are all, a lot of uh, common features that you can use in the uh, application services. For a, such a small code, ABP actually uh, makes it easier or completely automates uh, a lot of uh, repeating code. Uh, after that, I want to uh, uh, show the second important topic in this talk. Uh, it's uh, inter microservice uh, messaging. Uh, I have also uh, already demonstrated that we can uh, call application services cl from client side, just like calling a method. It handles all the REST operation. It's same for microservices, actually. If you want to uh, synchronously call from microservice A to microservice B, just share the application contracts with the target, uh, with the uh, client microservice, and just call the application service functionality. All the uh, complicated stuff, including ident server uh, authentication and everything, is handled by the ABP framework. The second way of messaging uh, microservices is a async way. Uh, this is called messaging or event. Uh, publishing. Uh, we typically uh, publish events uh, events from uh, microservices uh, using some RabbitMQ or Kafka or some message broker. You know, we publish the event and consume events uh, from other microservices. Every microservice has its own database. So generally, we make some changes in the database and publish an event related to this uh, this change. Uh, what what is the problem here? The the essential problem is the infrastructure that is. We if we don't use a pre-built solution for that, we should deal with reconnection problems, uh, retry problems, uh, dealing with low-level APIs of RabbitMQ uh, client library for publishing and subscribing uh, events. You uh, if you uh, check. Uh, source code of a serious project, you see a lot of abstractions uh, around this uh, event system. So ABP solves all these problems. And also there is an important problem which is solved with ABP5 is the transaction problem. Let me uh, summarize it. Uh, microservice A makes some change in the database and publishes an event about this change. The problem here is that the first data source is SQL database, for example. The second uh, one is another uh, standalone application, a message broker like RabbitMQ. So there is no way to establish a transaction uh, scope that uh, includes both of database operation and event publishing. So you may end up with uh, making change on the database, but cannot publish the event. Or uh, vice versa, you may publish the event but when you want to commit the transaction, you get an exception. So you publish it an event of an, uh, of an operation, which is actually not completed. So you, you, want, you should deal with uh, rollback events and a lot of uh, stuff. The, uh, one of the solution of that problem is uh, outbox and inbox patterns. 
Um, there are some libraries around for uh, here for .NET, but ABP provides a pre-built solution for that, beginning from the five uh, version. This was one of the most wanted feature of uh, the framework. ABP provides an event pass, so uh, we uh, publish events throughout ABP's event pass. It doesn't immediately publish, but actually writes an outbox query and uh, this write operation is included in the same unit of fork or uh, with another word, uh, the same transaction with the with your actual operation. So uh, it's uh, all of none. Uh, if the transaction fails, the message disappears and all your operation is rolled back. So it's guaranteed that uh, if your operation succeeds, uh, the message is written to the outbox. Then ABP's background workers uh, gets this message from Outbox and sent to message broker with retry mechanism. Uh, RabbitMQ may be offline at that time, and when it becomes online, the messages are guaranteed to be delivered. And also, uh, inbox pattern is vice versa, and this is also uh, uh, one of the important patterns because when you get a message, if you directly uh, execute it, there is, uh, there is a problem you may duplicate the execution. Because in some cases, RabbitMQ sends message to you, but uh, you may not uh, send the acknowledgement message to the RabbitMQ. So it retries the same message and you re-execute the same event again. So this is another problem. ABP solves this by inbox pattern and also it checks if this message was uh, received before. Uh, and it uh, retries until the success uh, point. So also ABP uh, works with uh, this work with the clustered environment. So it uses distributed locking for that. So if you have a multiple instance of that microservice, uh, it has that problem because it uses some distributed lock system to execute uh, the QE in one uh, microservice in a time. Uh, and also it has auto events. That means, for example, there are some typical events. Uh, if you have a product entity, for example, you typically publish, create, delete, and update events. ABP automates the, uh, publishing these events for all entities when you enable for an entity. This is one also uh, good point about the uh, message. Uh, I might show demo. It may be complicated uh, for this talk, but I want to show some simple code uh, at least. Uh, yeah, I have a, a demo service. Uh, it's created to the item in the database, and that's all. I, I just uh, configured ABP framework to automatically publish uh, to the, uh, the events for the to the item. That means if uh, I create, delete, or update that kind of entity, it automatically publish events to the event bus. Uh, with the inbox and outbox patterns uh, in, uh, executed. And also, uh, it doesn't publish actually the entity class because entity class is not well serializable and uh, it can be dangerous to uh, share all the details of our entity. So we can create a, a DTO-like object and it can automatically map this uh, entity to uh, DTO object. So uh, publishing is actually automatically done. Uh, I have uh, not uh, shown that. Uh, the handling, handling side is simple. Uh, ABP provides an I distributed event handler interface, which is a generic class, a generic interface. Uh, you read right here the uh, event type, and you have a handle event method. Uh, and then you can just execute the event. You can throw exceptions safely. If you throw exception, it will be retried and everything works as expected. So you just uh, execute uh, the event handling logic. Uh, then it's like that. If you want to manually publish an uh, event, there is a distributed event bus class uh, interface. Then you can just call its publish method and with an uh, object to transfer, uh, then it's published to event bus. Actually, it's very simple to use uh, and provides all the 
uh, implements all the details for us. And also, uh, sometimes we may, we may uh, publish events uh, inside the entity. We cannot inject services to entity, you know. So uh, ABP provides some methods for that. That comes from the base classes, like at distributed event. If you, if I call a distributed event method uh, in my entity, it's quit uh, quit uh, inside the uh, current unit of work, and once I commit the transaction, it's automatically distrib uh, published to the distributed event bus. So ABP actually uh, provides end-to-end -end, uh, infrastructure for uh, messaging between uh, microservices. Any question about here? It may it may uh, be fast, but I want to uh, use the time <laughs> efficient. Yeah. Well, no, that so that's really interesting, and I think what you're showing is is important because, like, you've shown the microservice implementation, and then you can run into these more advanced problems. And what's nice is you've already had to work through this as you're building this with your customers, etc., and you've solved. You've made it easy, so when you run into these sorts of problems, you can handle that. Yeah, this is really a serious problem, and every developer trying to uh, solve it <laughs> themselves. I, I am getting too many uh, feedbacks about that, and now it will be available with ABP5. Uh, uh, we, we had a few questions, I think, from the chat. It looks like these are all things that are not in yet or on the roadmap, but um, uh, one was uh, GraphQL support. Um, no, not yet. It's not uh, inside or short-term term roadmap, actually. Uh, I, I'm not sure about GraphQL. Uh, but we will work, work with uh, gRPC, uh, but not GraphQL yet. Okay. And then there's a question about CQRS. And CQRS like uh, was always be, have been, uh, has been in our <laughs> roadmap, actually. This is also one of the most wanted features, and this will be a complementary feature of the framework. But uh, we haven't started it yet because uh, framework does a lot of things actually uh, currently, and uh, adding a feature is a such a great, uh, such a big feature is very serious uh, decision. We haven't mm -hmm. started it yet, but it's in our roadmap. Okay. One other roadmap sort of question is um, like MongoDB and Cosmos DB. It also works for, with MongoDB. All the modules has MongoDB provider. MongoDB is a first uh, class citizen from the beginning, so it's not a problem uh, with that. For Cosmos DB, we have some, uh, we, we have tried a few times to be honest, but uh, the work uh, was left uh, as half, uh, so we didn't continue. Uh, we are expecting from Anti Framework team. They are working on Cosmos DB integration. If they successfully do that, uh, it will already work because we are working with <laughs> Anti Framework. Great. Okay. Um, one one other question, then I'll turn it back to you. Um, on on your thing that you were just showing, what happens if things get stuck in the message bus? Yeah, actually, uh, in which stage I, I can ask? Uh, for example. If uh, we cannot publish message broker, uh, if we cannot reach to message broker, it tries to reconnect, and when it connects, it gets from outbox and sends to the message broker. It tries again and again until a delivery acknowledgement is uh, received. So actually, there is no problem here. If RabbitMQ loses the message, so what I should, <laughs> what we can do? <laughs> okay. All right. Wow, okay, so that is a lot of stuff. Uh, okay, and you said we have about, say, 10 more minutes or so, if you, if you wanna. Uh, okay, I will I will be fast. Uh, you can for... go a little bit longer, 15 okay. minutes. Uh, as I said, it uh, fully uh, supports multi-tenancy. Uh, it determines the current tenant based on domain name, cookies, or uh, from some uh, resources. It automatically isolates data database. It can also uh, work with uh, multiple database where a tenant uh, have a dedicated database or some tenants are sharing uh, the same data database. It dynamically selects the right database. Uh, and it also can uh, store configuration based on tenants. 
the goal is uh, to create a multi-tenancy unaware application. It's uh, actually possible now. And the multi-tenancy infrastructure uh, works like that. The same code works with multi-tenant or single tenant uh, cases. Uh, so uh, it's really powerful, but I cannot go details. Uh, it also provides a teaming system. I don't, uh, I want to go faster. Uh, the teaming system is important because we are creating a modular system and module developer should now uh, know about the team because every application can uh, select another UI team. Uh, this is mo most customized part of an application, you know. So we have created a uh, teaming system which defines layouts, common libraries, all the uh, teams are depending on. We have created header toolbar, menu widget systems, bonding and minification systems. We have uh, taught that teaming system a lot and uh, created a standard teaming system. So you, this was the uh, user interface you have already seen in my demo. But with a, uh, installing another package, another U UI team package, it becomes like that. It's more production ready. Uh, this is, uh, we are calling Lepton team. This is Lepton X team. It will be available with uh, ABP5. It has also dark team support. This is another team based on ABP framework. So we, I see some community uh, members are creating uh, some team integrations. So ABP's team structure is very strong. Uh, I want to show it in action. It will just take one minute. Uh, I will show demo from the ABP commercial uh, to show the team team's power. This is based on ABP, but has more modules like software as a service module, identity server management module, language management module, and a lot of more. I want to show the team side. You see, we have a dynamic team here. We want a dark team. Yeah, it's here. Just changing on the fly. We want top menu and box it layout. That's all. Uh, and we want left menu. Yeah, there are a lot of UI teams here uh, for the ABP commercial side. Uh, I, I want to show the tenancy side. For example, I create I can create a new tenant, uh, and when I create, I can uh, select a, a connection string, so it, it, the tenant has a dedicated database. And uh, I log out the application. I want to switch to that tenant. Uh, for demo purposes, I am manually switching, but if I uh, use it production, uh, it will be uh, determined from the subdomain or domain name, so we don't have to manually change the tenant. Now I switch to, to Volos of Tenant, and I can uh, log in with this tenant admin user, and I have I now see a different functionality. For example, I cannot see some pages like uh, tenant management page because this is already a tenant. I have different role lists, I have different users, I have different settings. I can change the team and it doesn't affect, affect the uh, other tenants. A lot of more. I can see my own audit logs and so on. So uh, the teaming system is very detailed. Uh, I, I want to skip these uh, features. There are a lot of features. Uh, there are a lot of features because uh, enterprise uh, applications regards uh, these features. In every application, uh, we deal with background job quiz system, some blob storing system, uh, sending emails or SMS messages, and so on. Uh, I want to mention what's coming with ABP5. Uh, it will be based on .NET 6, Bootstrap 5. Currently, we are using Bootstrap 4. Uh, this is a breaking change, unfortunately, but we have to do it with uh, this major change. Uh, we are working on that uh, to make uh, it easy for developers. Distributed event pass outbox inbox patterns I mentioned. We, I have uh, shown dynamic proxies. It's already available in JavaScript side. 
we are we are creating static proxies which generates code. Uh, this is some this has some use case in uh, some points. We are creating a new team and we are creating an example solution uh, like a shop on containers <laughs> like e shop on ABP. Uh, it's a, will be it will be a clone of the a shop containers application and a simplified clone to demonstrate how it is uh, done with the ABP framework uh, bit simpler. Uh, last slide, uh, I want to show some resources to uh, learn ABP framework. Uh, I was just about to ask you to. So that, and if you could, um, so there's the, uh, the documentation and then there's that eShop. Yeah, I, will, I will mention about that. Uh, documentation is really great. <laughs> uh, you can just explore it. It's very detailed and also it's covering uh, not only ABP framework, but also some software development best practices uh, and so on. Uh, there is an ABP community website, community.abp.io, uh, which is uh, which presents some articles and tutorials or video posts created by our team and also by community. So you can just uh, follow this to learn some uh, problems solved with the ABP framework, like project high integration uh, and so on, or using some workflow engine with the ABP framework, uh, or replacing ident server. This was similar to your question, uh, and so on. Uh, another uh, source is a book that was created by me. Uh, it's, it has more than 100 pages. It's basically uh, a practical guide for implementing domain-driven design with the ABP framework. Uh, actually, it uh, shows explicit examples and uh, detailed suggestions uh, about implementing all the details, low-level details, including aggregates and domain services, application services, DDD, uh, data transfer objects, specification pattern, and a lot of more. If you want to implement DDD, I definitely suggest that, uh, and also I am actively writing a book uh, from Pact Publishing. It will be uh, published uh, in the beginning of uh, next year, Mastering ABP Framework. Uh, when it's published, uh, you can buy that from Amazon. Uh, another uh, learning stuff uh, is ABP blog. We are publishing uh, some uh, articles and uh, new features about that. Uh, for example, uh, we are working on an ABP uh, eShop on ABP project, as I mentioned. It contains three microservices at the beginning. You, it's extensible. You can add your microservices. It has multiple gateways and applications inside it using a uh, different database for all microservices. It's integrated with Ident server. Uh, and actually, uh, it will contain Kubernetes deployment uh, configuration and a lot of more. We are actively working on it. Uh, I think it will be uh, completed in a few months. Uh, currently, it works with Thai uh, for development purpose. Uh, another interesting project based on ABP is CMS Kit project. Uh, I have been always asked that if ABP is a CMS. I said always said uh, not. They are comparing with uh, you know Orchard project, uh, which is CMS focused. While it's uh, in the last version, it is focused. Uh, it's uh, split the uh, CMS uh, side from the core framework. Anyway, uh, we we decided to create a CMS kit module. That's not a CMS solution but it provides low-level components that you create your own CMS. I, I, we, to, we thought that's uh, better because if you want to use CMS, uh, just use WordPress. It's a full feature. But if you want to create a CMS that's well integrated with your .NET solution, that's, that's a perfect start point. It's, uh, you can create dynamic pages, blocks. Uh, you can have a tagging system. Any, you can tag any kind of thing. You can tag blog posts, you can tag pace, everything. You can comment under everything. You can just add comment under a blog page or a, a standard page or a, under a, another uh, stuff. Uh, I, it has a I, I did this last night 
and the walkthrough was really smooth. The one thing I had to, uh, I got stuck for a second was I had to give myself permission. I had to go into the admin and give myself CMS permission. But once I did, it's it's really cool, and it includes uh, you can add things to the navigation and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, it, it's it brings some uh, pace, uh, like comments. Everything is extensible and composable. For example, you can compose comment system with reaction, so you uh, users can react to your comments. That's very cool. Uh, and so on. We, we will have more components and documentation in the future. It's in the early stage. Another thing is ABP is a modular system and it has a lot of open source modules. Uh, CMS kit was one of them. And one of them is interestingly the documentation system. Documentation system is actually a module of ABP framework. It's open source and free. Uh, it's a very good documentation system. It includes searching, it's responsive, uh it can integrate to integrate to, to uh, github you see contributors or you can just click and contribute to the documentation just like microsoft's documentation system uh, it supports versioning multiple language and a lot of more features it's just open source and free and it's a good example of abp modules there are a lot of modules like that uh, and also there are some commercial modules uh, this is how we gain money on top of this uh, open source project. Uh, for example, there is a, uh, as I said before, a file management module, like you have a, a Google Drive-like file management uh, module in your application. You can just share uh, files with your uh, users and so on. Uh, and there are, there is a, uh, say that, uh, payment modules, language management for, module, for example, you can just uh, translate your UI on the fly and so on. There are a lot of modules here. And actually this was my uh, presentation about uh, the ABP framework. Uh, you can just check these resources uh, to learn the ABP framework. Uh, we are uh, leading this project as a Volosoft company uh, the company is based on actually this project uh, and it's growing. We have now 20 technical guys dedicated uh, on that open source project and commercial modules and it's growing. I, I think um, I, I really appreciate that, that. So sometimes people say, oh, I only want open source if it's completely free or whatever. And I really, over time, have learned that having a sustainable company that's able to provide support and you know that i know is going to stay around and like you said i definitely people know that <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i i really think that you've struck a really good balance there where you have a, an open source core and a lot of functionality that's available for free and then if i am an enterprise or a business that wants to pay for support and advanced modules that's great so I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, actually, there are a lot of companies are trusting to uh, ABP framework and ABP commercial. Like, uh, there are very big companies like Siemens, PwC, Atlas Air. Uh, I don't want to <laughs> go to this. It is okay. Maybe it's not true to say it here, uh, but I can say that uh, we. Let's let's see that uh, we have re re rewrite the entire framework framework. Uh, beginning from five years ago, but we still maintain the ASP.NET boilerplate. This is very important thing because there are a lot of people trusted to that framework and created a lot of projects. We cannot just throw it uh, and uh, start a new project. It still continues. And in the last uh, months, it uh, becomes a part of .NET Foundation. You already know that. Yeah, and, so uh, Thank you, Microsoft, about that. Uh, maybe we uh, with the ABPIO we uh, try to enter to uh, .NET Foundation, so it is still continuously developed and uh, it's up to date. It's just over uh, currently upgrading to .NET 6. So uh, th that shows that uh, we are uh, doing a serious work and we just uh, don't uh, throw out projects. Yeah. Well, we have to we have to wrap up because we have uh, Visual Studio Toolbox is starting in a few minutes. So I, okay. I um, but thank you very much 
for a great presentation and also just for for your support of the community over all these years. It's it's a really it's exciting to see a, a project grow over time and build this community and and um, so. I thank yeah. you, John, very much. This was a great opportunity for us because uh, uh, promoting open source libraries is not easy. And my, uh, we are very happy that Microsoft is supporting this kind of projects. And we are uh, closely following your uh, weekly standoffs. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to your team also. I know Alper and, and friends, everyone was in the background answering questions and, and very much appreciate that. Too. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. So, All right, goodbye. Uh, let me play the goodbye, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, stick around for Visual Studio Toolbox. Okay. <laughs>